Welcome everyone to another edition of our inaugural season still of Masonic Light Talk. Your host, Past Master Rod Funderburk of Bivouac Lodge number 503. And we're hailing from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and we are part of the 30th district where our worshipful master is Dewan A. Muhammad and our district deputy is Terry Andrews. And of course, we are led in the state of North Carolina by our grand master, uh, Daniel D.T. Thompson. And as you, everyone knows, the true purpose of Sonic Light Talk is just to give the craft and those who are a little bit interested in masonry outside of the craft to see who the men are behind the Grand Lodge titles as well as, as, well as the regular titles who are doing work in the lodges as well as the communities. And this allows them to see that, hey, we're all just regular people with regular lives. We're experiencing you know, all the good, we're experiencing the bad. And as far as this COVID-19 goes, we are also experiencing the ugly along with everyone else. And today we have a very, very special guest with us. He is the right worshipful Grand Tyler, Dr. Michael Blair, MD. And he is the Tyler for the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of free and accepted Masons of North Carolina and Jurisdictions Incorporated. And Dr. Dr. Blair, it is so good to have you today. How are you doing uh, amidst this COVID-19 times right now? I'm doing good. How, uh, how about you? Brother, I'm hanging in there. I'm just trying to follow the rules. I'm trying to wear my mask whenever they tell me to. Uh, you know, I find myself sometimes stepping out the, the car and going into the grocery <laughs> store. And, you know, sometimes I forget that mask. And as soon as I get to the door, I see someone coming out the store with the mask on and I immediately turn right back around to go back and get my mask, trying to be obedient, you know, as the good book tells us to be, you know what I mean? Uh, so other than that, I'm doing all I can. But again, thank you for taking the time out to be here with us today on Masonic Light Talk. You and I, we've not really had an opportunity to kind of just talk and sit down and talk as, as brothers and just get to really know one another. But I am looking forward to doing more of that outside of this format here. Uh, now, one of the things a lot of people don't know about you is that you are a doctor and you're in the field of medicine. Um, is it orthopedics and prosthetics? Yes. Yes. Would you would you just enhance and go a little <clears throat> bit more into that and what you do uh, so that people can know that, hey, we've got all kinds of brothers in the Masonic family, professionals in every field out here in the world. If you would just expand on what you do. When I got out of the um, Marine Corps, that was one thing. Uh, but what happened, um, being in combat, I've been eight combat tours in the Marine Corps. Yes, sir. And see, and see my brothers, um, you know, get blown up, losing limbs. Mm. Uh, it, it was a tragedy, you know. I lost, I lost my best friend uh, over there. Um, so I wear, I wear this. Uh, you see this right here? Yes, sir. This, this bracelet right here for him. Yes, sir. Uh, see if I, I can put it in there, right there. That uh -huh. bracelet, that bracelet. Yes, sir. Uh, I lost him back in uh, twenty twenty or 2003, so it's been uh, 17 years, you know, March 29th, it's a, it's a, it's a big day. Uh, William White, you know, he um, got blown up in a uh, IED, improvised explosive device, and he landed in the Euphrates River, one of the deepest rivers, you know, in, in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was dead before he fell in the river, obviously. But me and him, we uh, came from Brooklyn, New York, you know, and he, he came into service, obviously, uh, a year before I did. No, uh, eight months before I did. But that struck me hard. And, you know, trying to give, trying to give something back to the community. Yes, sir. Um, it was just something that in the medical field that I went, I was like, listen, you know, if I can give anything back to the, to something, you know, to the brothers, to the sisters, I wanted to give back something. So I went into the field of uh, medicine, you know, and I worked in the orthopedic department. Uh, Dr. Wheatley was one of my mentors, you know, he, um, I worked in the medical department of orthopedics field, and that was something I wanted to do. Um, so what I ended up doing, I worked there for three years almost, and it would have been Carolina Orthopedics and Sports Medicine is where I worked at, two years over there. Um, 
but I wanted to further that, you know what I'm saying? And so that was yes, like something that I wanted to do. Uh, so what I ended up doing was uh, getting a PhD too. And I got it in uh, electrical engineering, computer science, and biomed. This is the okay. biomed part. So that, was, that was the whole thing I wanted to start fabricating. Yes, sir. So that, that's what that, I, is also, that's what that also allows you to help fabricate and do some engineering of prosthetics yourself, then, correct? Yes, sir. That is yes, sir. awesome. That is awesome. Yeah. Well, brother, that is a heck of a story, and I am so sorry that you had lost your best friend. And, you know, war is something, you know, I guess it's inevitable. Um, the bad thing about it is it's a shame that the people who control whether or not we go to war, they usually get to sit in the office somewhere. And, you know, they're, yeah. someone once told me war is, you know, old men talking and young men dying. And uh, that, is, that is so sad. You know what I mean? Yeah. That is so sad. But I commend you on on allowing God to use you and use that situation to other you to be able to help and serve someone else. I do commend you on going forward on that. And thank you. And Grand, welcome and thank you again for being with us on the show. And I'm going to get into a little bit more, I guess, Masonic talk and what we have going on. Um, and I guess the first question is, you know, I'd like to know where you're hailing from. What lodge are you hailing from? But Lodge gets the most uh, bit of your time, Dr. Blair. Mount Horb Lodge, number 73 in Jacksonville, North Carolina, 7 Masonic District. Right here where I am. That's my home. I've been here. I've been a member of there eight years. I've been in Masonry eight years. Okay. So that's where I'm hailing from right there. Good deal. Now, you said you've been in Masonry eight years. Tell us a little bit about your Masonic journey. You know, how did that journey start? What attracted you to Masonry and... What was your journey like bringing you up to this day and time now? Well, so when I was younger, you know, I always didn't see the guys, um, you know, uh, with the Masonic rings on. You know, my grandfather, he was Mason too. But he would never tell me nothing about it, ever. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that, that's just how it was. He, I just seen him go to the meetings, whatever, like way back in the days. But it was just like I was like everybody else, secret society, whatever. You see him in the black suit. But um, what really piqued my interest was when I was on a drill field. So back in 2007, I met an uh, individual named uh, Raheem Lee. Me and him still talk to this day. Mm -hmm. um, we, we start talking, and one of these, he, he actually is a member of Mount Horde Lodge, number 73, actually. Uh -huh. he, said, he said, when you get to Jacksonville, because that's where my next movie station, He's like, when you get to Jacksonville, North Carolina, he was like, I need you to look up certain brothers over there. He's like, you need to talk to them. He said, if you're really interested, you know, you would do what you need to do. And that was back in 2010. So I got with another brother in, over there in the lodge, and this brother, you know, I talked to him, and it was so funny that he was like, uh, if you really need to do what you need to do, his name was Brother Walton, actually. Uh -huh. I started talking to Brother Walton. And he was a real good brother. I'm telling you right now, like I said, I started talking to him in 2000, maybe end of 2010, 2011. But he would not give me a petition. I'm telling you right now, he, he didn't like he didn't give me a petition until I started talking to him. Maybe it was like six, seven months. Mm -hmm. He wanted to make sure I was good. You know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. And I met him the first time I met him. I met him at a bookstore. All right, he, I met him at a bookstore, and he was like, all right, let me get this bookstore. So we started talking. Next thing you know, I met him at one of the lodge functions. Then again, I met him somewhere else. Then I met him somewhere else again. Then I met him somewhere else again. And he finally gave me a lodge petition. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up getting my first degree. So I, I, I got my first degree, and then once I got my first degree, it took me, so 2011, I got my first degree, but I didn't become a master mason until June of 2012, so almost a whole year later, because I think I either left, so I did something within the Marine Corps, I still was a Marine, mm -hmm. and um, it took me a while, like, I mean, it wasn't no wham, bam, I got all my degrees like that, you know what I'm saying, so right. it, it gave me a whole generalized, like, hey, you know, this is not something that they're gonna give me, you know what I mean? So it made me, it gave me a complete understanding. Like, hey, I remember the guys in the black suits, you know, the three of them, 
I remember all of them. They came to my house. They met my wife. It was like, hey, you know, are, are you comfortable with your husband doing this, this, and this? What if he got to leave at certain time? And she's like, hey, you know, I'm comfortable with this, this, and this. So uh, it gave me a complete understanding of what masonry is, like it's true brotherhood, you know. Um, this is how it's going to be. This is what you're going to be doing. But that gave me a whole complete sense of what masonry was about. Because to this day right now, like I said, I've been to Mason for eight years and I probably only signed maybe three or four petitions myself as a past yes, master for Mason's coming into the lodge. Because yes, that, that brother, Brother Walton, like I said, showed me that it's not about the quantity, it's about quality of the brother. That's right. You know what I'm saying? And me being a Mason, like I said, I've been in eight years and I probably literally only missed three meetings in my eight years of Mason. Yes, and they all been for something serious, you know what I'm saying? So yes, sir. That, but he showed me that it's not just about being a mason, just because I got something on my my collar, my ring I'm wearing, or something of that nature. It showed me that you know being there is what it's what it's about, you know. Yes, so he he showed me something like it, it was real, it was real, it was really than real, you know what I mean? Yes, sir. I do understand that part of the journey because I've been a mason for 12 years now, and I've only signed two petitions myself. So I know exactly what you're talking about. It's definitely about the quality of the brother. And if a brother's not going to be able to come in, contribute, you know, it's like what Kennedy used to say, old President Kennedy, he'd say, not at, don't ask what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. So the same thing with masonry. What can you do for masonry? You know, masonry you has get, plenty of brothers. You know what I mean? Exactly. And you're yes, trying sir. to get what I got. That's right. That's right. You're exactly right. That is awesome. Now, what are some of the positions in, uh, that you held uh, in the, um, the blue house that you're that you're most proud of. Um, so the biggest thing, okay, so like I said, I'm a past master, but the biggest thing I can tell you right now that I held in the blue house is the KOP. Because so I was a you. KOP advisor, and mm -hmm. then from becoming an advisor, I became the assistant Eastern Regional Director. And right mm -hmm. now, I'm a past Eastern Regional Director in the KOP. Mm -hmm. So that's and before you go on, for, just for the listeners out there who will be listening. The KOP is the Knights of Pythagoras, and that is our young men's department, the young men who are coming up. And that's just a quick background for the listeners when you say KOP, just so they'll know. Yes. Go ahead, Dr. So, Blair. So right now, I'm a past uh, assistant regional director for the KOP. Beautiful. And that right there is probably the biggest accomplishment that I can have, you know what I'm saying? And, and for, you know, um, anybody who doesn't know, but... Uh, uh, Floyd Duhon, you know, God rest his soul, you know, he passed away. But um, that was my road dog. You know what I'm saying? Yes, he, was the Eastern, he was the Eastern Regional Director. Yes, sir. But that was my ride or die. Like, everywhere he went, I was with him. You know, and I was, I was under him. Yes, sir. So when it came to the KOP, we did everything. And as, as far as the Blue House goes, it doesn't matter like what title I hold the Blue House. The, the, the youth is probably the biggest thing I can hold. And right now, I work I work with uh, Randolph Dickinson, who is the Eastern Regional Director right now. And, you know, for him to say when he did, uh, when we did just did our virtual KOP thing with them, and for him to say, you know, me being his right-hand man right now, for him giving me that shout-out and saying he could do nothing without me. I mean, that's, that's a humbling thing to say. I, like I said, I'm that's a very awesome. humble guy. You yes, know, sir. like, like if you say, you know, a lot of people don't know I'm a dog dude. That's because I don't put it out there like that. I don't just yes, go sir. about saying you know, I'm such and such. I, I'm just, I'm just a humble dude. And, you know, I don't, I don't look for the accolades. I could care less what I got. I, it's just, I'm just me. Yes, sir. How, you know, yes, sir. So, you know, we have uh, <laughs> talked, yeah, we've talked in passing, you know, at the Grand Lodge. And of oh. course, I had no idea that you were a doctor. And as you said, you're one of the most humble brothers that I've met. You told me, you said, brother, it's good to meet you. If you need anything or I can get you anything, let me know. And I just really appreciate you, you know, allowing me to feel comfortable. And, and it was just nothing but hospitality coming directly from you. And I appreciate you giving me that feeling at Grand Lodge. That was awesome. That was awesome. Sure. And speaking of Grand Lodge, you are our right worshipful Grand Tyler. Um, can you tell us, a little bit of the duties of that position, um, you know, without giving away, of course, any any Masonic secrets. What can you what can you tell us about the duties of the, of the position of being the Grand Title? 
Well, a lot of people think it's so funny. A lot of people think just being a grandchild, you can sit outside the door and just guard the door. Yes, sir. You at the lodge. But in reality, one of the big things as a grandchild is one, you are the grandmaster of personal security. So one, when the grandmaster moves, you move. Yes, sir. And if people look at my if people look at my stewardship report, when they look at when we do grand lodge testing, they will see that it's a lot of movement that I do um, with the grandmaster. When he uh-huh. goes places, I go. Sure. And one thing, this is masonry. When people look at masonry, masonry is a business, right? Yes, but sir. this is not a paid position by no means. You know that all that all that movement I do it comes out of my pocket. Yes, sir. So another thing that people don't realize is we got to support the grand lodge raffle. Yes. When you are a grand lodge officer. That's five hundred dollars to come out your pocket off top when you do them grand line raffle tickets. Yes, and people don't understand, you know, they want people want to jockey for positions all the time. And I and I look at it like this, I told people when we did the vote for last year and all them people ran for the grand title, which is it's cool. Like I said, you can run for the grand title all you want to. But let it be known. Five hundred dollars is coming out your pocket instantaneously as an elected officer. That's right. So you you be if you want to be the grand or elected officer in the grand lodge line or even an appointed officer, two hundred fifty dollars is coming out your pocket, or five hundred dollars as an elected officer is coming out your pocket instantaneously yes, for the grand lodge rapid ticket. You're gonna pay, so it's not something that you're doing for free. You're you are you are saying that I will support the grandmaster and the grand lodge rapid. That's right. right. All right, now two, if people paid attention to the grandmaster when he gave his um grand lodge duty for the grand lodge officer one thing that they did notice that as the grand grand tyler i had duties and responsibilities a couple of them duties and responsibilities that that he that that he noticed that when we had them was that the grand tyler i I run the 12 for 12 initiative right now that's what that's one of my duties as a grand tyler i run the 12 for 12 initiative i do the 12 for 12 initiative i do the community outreach department that's that's an department of mine um the veterans, the, the veterans department, that's mine. Yes. Um, I also, I'm also am co-chairing the raffle now with the deputy grandmaster. That's another one of my departments. I also, uh, uh the Grand Lodge Historic Society. That's another one of my departments. Mm-hmm. So Grand Tyler, I'm just not sitting outside of the door, you know? Right. So I have areas of responsibility that I chair. Right. So yes, if that is something that people want to do, by all means, let them have it. You know, <laughs> I, I tell people all the time, you know, you don't just, we don't just work when we go to Grand Lodge as a Grand Lodge officer. And I, I just want to make that clear to people. As Grand Lodge yes, officers, we don't just work when Grand Lodge is in session. We have quarterly meetings. We have this, this, and this. As Grand Lodge officers elected positions, we work all the time. Yes, sir. You know what I'm saying? Grandmaster calls, guess what? We we make it happen and that's that's what people need to understand you know um you're an appointed officer so you you might want to people might want to think about it when 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 they want to run for a grand lodge position they might want to think like you know you at the beck and call of the grand master and if that's what you want to do by all means make it happen but it, it, it comes from with some responsibility oh definitely definitely and thank you for enlightening uh, me and the rest of the craft on the duties of the Tyler and explaining that it's way much more than just sitting outside of a door, a lot more. And like you said, a lot of it is coming directly out of your pocket. You're at the beck and call of the Grand Master. And something else that you're doing is you're helping with the day-to-day business operations because you're a part of the executive committee, correct? Yes, I am. And I'm, I'm going to tell you one other thing, you know, what a lot of people don't know, but I will tell you this, and this is, this is something bad that happened to me. And now I realize I've done so much in the Grand Lodge that I got in an accident my first year and change as a Grand Tyler because moving so much that I thought I could just drive this, 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 do this, this, and this. I got in a car accident. Oh man. Because I went to I went to so this is this is how much traveling I was doing with the Grand Master. I went to South Carolina, Virginia, DC and north carolina and then i and this was duhan was on his deathbed so i went to see past master duhan and then two out and then an hour later i found out he passed away so i was on my way home 
And then I was an exit away from my exit. And then my body just shut down on me. And I ran into the barrier that the truck that stopped trucks on the 40. Yes. And and I I totaled my truck on the 40. That that was how much traveling I was doing with the Grandmaster. And I called the Grandmaster and told him, you know, I was like, I'm all right, this, this, and this. But my wife, I, my wife was like, see, that's, you're doing so much traveling. She said, instead of you driving so many places, you need to start staying overnight. You right. know what I'm saying? Right. So it, it was just ridiculous. Like, but people don't understand, you know, that's a lot of sacrifices that you're doing and you're traveling. But I, w- I was thinking like, you know, I'm good. I can just drive this, this, yes, this. Yes, sir. Instead of staying overnight. But that's a lot of sacrifices that you're putting in on your body, you know? And I was like, well, from now on, I'm going to stay overnight, get rest what I need, and then keep it moving. But yeah, I got an accident. All the oh, wow. well, I, well, I'm so glad that you're okay, man. And, uh, you know, you're talking about your body shutting down. You know, a lot of times our mind will say, hey, keep moving, keep moving, keep yes. moving. But when that body is done and it's had enough, it is going to let us know. But, so, but I am believe, so glad that you're okay, me, my brother. And, and believe me, the Grandmaster scolded me, too. He said, he said hey, you the Grand Tyler, but... What what you gonna do when you're dead? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. He said you can work do right. it already. Then what you gonna do when you're dead? So he told me hey, Grandmaster scolded me. Best believe he did. Yeah, so. yeah, and he was supposed to. Yes. <laughs> he was supposed to. <laughs> but the main thing is that you are okay, and then that also shows a level of dedication that you have to your duties, and that's very important in masonry. You know, the brothers in masonry, we have duties and obligation, and it is so so very important that we take them seriously, and obviously yes, you do. As a matter of fact, we need you to scale back just a little bit and, and listen yes, to your wife. Listen to your wife yeah, and oh, spend the night and get you oh, rest, yeah, oh, whatever yeah. you need to. Oh, yeah, yes, sir. I, I do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Good deal. Yes, sir. Now, along with a lot of those duties that you got going on, I got another question. Amidst this COVID-19, how are things going operation-wise with the Grand Lodge? Where do you see us going immediately right now uh, amidst this COVID-19? Well, one thing we're doing, I mean, you know, we always have meetings, you know, with the Grand Lodge and the Grand Master. Um, he talked to us about that. So what we do is we follow the protocol of the governor. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's that simple. So um, we'll have a meeting pretty soon about, you know, um, we are going to get together with the Grand Master. But the biggest thing we do is what the governor puts out, we try to follow that along with what the governor puts out. So if the governor puts out something of us following the protocol, being in this position where we need to be uh, so many people within so many uh, so many thousand feet, that's what we do. And if um, we're going to have a meeting pretty soon, um, how are we going to move forward with this? You know, um, this, we, we want to have our brothers and sisters, you know, um, get back into the swing of things. But uh, we're trying to just follow what the governor's putting out because definitely a lot of our members are older. Mm-hmm. We, we we don't want those members to get sick, and believe right. me, the grandmaster does not want to bury anybody over yes, COVID nineteen because yes, that's sir. the last thing that's the last thing we want to do. Yes, sir. Um, but uh, best believe we we are trying to get back to what we're trying to get back to, and um, that's that's pretty much what it is. But okay, well that's good to know because we realize that what the Grand Lodge is doing. It's taking the safety precautions because the lives of our membership is the most important thing. So hopefully everyone out there is understanding that. And, you know, we're getting down a little bit to the end of our show here. And um, I just wanted to ask, uh, and and this is something that you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but, you know, as we get ready to, uh, you know, go into a new session, a new year and all that stuff, Mm -hmm. And it's something that you touched on. You know, some people may want to run for Tyler. Some people may want to run for various positions. Are you ready to tell us whether or not you have plans on staying at Tyler or is there somewhere else you planning on moving around if you have higher goals in mind, as they say? And uh, if, if you'd rather not say right now, then we don't have any issues if you'd rather not say. But, you know, we're always curious as to where you plan to be on it at the line. I will be running for the Grand Tyler again. Good deal. I, I, I will. I will be running for the Grand Tyler again, no doubt. Good deal. I mean... I love my job. Um, I still haven't made the mark, like, you know, um, where I am, you know, obviously, um, I still got work to do. You know, okay. I, I still got work to do. I support the Grandmaster in all his efforts. So, um, well, Brother I'm, Blair, I tell you right now, has, grand, has the Grand Tyler that you are and the way you've exemplified 
your duties and everything that you do, you definitely have my vote, my brother. I will be voting for you another term as a Grand Tyler. And I appreciate all that you've done and how you supported the Grand Law, supported the Grand Master and everything. I appreciate you very much. And before we get ready and wrap up and get out of here, is there anything else that you would like to share with the craft, with the body, with the listeners out there who will be listening to this particular show? Yes, you know what? I'm, I'm going to tell people like this. Um, as young black males, as young white males, young whatever, whatever color you are, green, black, whatever, um, my story is simple. You know, I was that wayward kid. And I'm going to tell you right now, I was that wayward kid. I had a choice to do the bad things, and I ain't got to get all into it, but I was, I, I was deep into the game. I'm going to let yes, you know sir. that right now. Um, I went to college, but I had some, some skeletons in the closet. I had a judge, and I'll tell you, name, Judge Santinelli. Um, I had that choice. He's about 80 years old right now. He's still alive. But I had something that came up on me, and he gave me a choice. I was either going to go to prison or I was going to go to the Marine Corps. That yes, was the sir. choice he gave me. And, I, and mind you, I'm a college graduate. I wow. just had graduated college in three years. But I'm thinking like I was good. You know what I'm saying? And there was a choice. It was an assault charge that came up. Yeah. But he gave me that choice either to go to the straight and narrow or go to prison. Right. So, of course, I'm not, I'm not going to prison. That's not what's going to happen. Right. But that dude right there, a white guy, I'm, I'm going to say it, you know, saved my life. You know uh -huh. what I mean? At 20 years old, he saved my life. Yes, sir. Uh, but, and the only thing he told me, I said, listen, I'll go to the Marine Corps any day of the week then go to prison. Right. And and this is, and from that day forward, you know, back in the 90s, I told him, I said, listen, I'm going to take myself to the recruiting station, sign up. Only thing in the recruiter, I told him, I said, I can't go to the Marine Corps before my 21st birthday. I just told him, I said, I can't do it. Right. So. Right. Me going to the Marine Corps saved my life, got me off the street. Like I said, from Brooklyn, New York, man, Flatbush, you know, oh. the, the pink houses. If right. anybody know about Brooklyn, Kings County is one of the worst counties you can ever grow up in. And I took right. my son there. I took my son there, and he's like, Dad, like, <laughs> I don't know how you did it. You know, my son is privileged. Like I said, he's, he's privileged. And privileged right. is what I mean, saying he grew up in the suburbs. He was born, right. he was born in California, you know, saying San, San Diego. Uh -huh. But he grew up here, you know, and and about I could pass anything to these young youth out here, you know, all this senseless killing we seen we seen out here with these cops, everything, man. It's a conversation you gotta have with these guys. You <laughs> cannot. I, I mean, I I can't stress enough. Whoever listening out here, if you are told to do somebody's cop, man, just just do it, man. Comply. There is no way, shape, or fashion that we gotta just not do it you know what i mean i mean yeah i shouldn't be sitting here right now i mean i did a whole bunch of craziness but at the same point in time cops ain't like they used to be back in the days they they just not right. it's like a, a shoot first mentality and ask questions later and, right. and they and, and and people's getting away with it so i mean i made that change um i'm a, I'm a true testament i'm telling you right now i'm a true testament so what you can do with that chain, I shouldn't be sitting here right now. I, I right. promise you, right? I shouldn't be sitting here. So if anybody listening out there and you think that that's what you're supposed to be doing, especially you young people, no, nah, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. I'm 40, 43 years old, man. And yes, sir. Believe me when I tell you, I done did it all. I done lived the life ridiculously. I done, I, I done talked to the youth about this. The KOP, I told them, Knights of the Faggot. I've done it all. Believe me when I tell you. And it's nothing nice out here. Right. So this goes for grown folk, young folk, old folk, white folk, black folk, purple folk, green, whatever you are. Man, just comply. We live in a world of sin right now. And, and we just, we, we just, we gotta, we, we gotta do what we gotta do, man. And for everybody else out there, man, I love to see our brothers and sisters get together. But one thing you better get together, dude, when it comes time to vote, y'all better get out there and vote. 
But that's the only time to pass it. You better get out there and vote. I love to see the black people rallying, but shit, you better rally at the polls. That's what you better do. So it's the last thing I got to pass for y'all. And I love all y'all. And, you know, let's keep it moving, man. Stay humble yes, out here. Yes, sir. Well, Dr. Blair, Brother Blair, thank you very much for those uh, last comments toward our youth. And we hope that they will comply as you are, you know, urging them to do so, so that they can remain alive just a little bit longer. I do appreciate your words. I do appreciate you for being on the show. Thank you so much. And I look forward to having you again on the show very, very, very soon. And Prince Hall family out there, I want to thank all of you for tuning in and listening to this edition of the Masonic Light Talk, Talk featuring the right worshipful Grand Tyler, Dr. Michael Blair. For those of you out there who are not a part of the Masonic family, remember, it's not hard to be a part of this family. All you have to do in order to be one, just ask one. I'm your host, Past Master Rod Funderburk of Bivouac Lodge number 503. Can't wait to see you guys on the next edition of Masonic Talk. Until then, my brothers and sisters, travel light.